couple of months ago, we were having a conversation here on NBL about sex. <laughs> and the reason I brought it up is because it occurred to me that there's an awful lot of, obviously, conversation about sex in like the public schools where they're teaching kids all kinds of stuff that parents may even be unaware of that's troublesome. And kids hear a lot about sex on school buses and from their friends and on the internet. But it isn't like the churches are talking a lot about sex, and and God's the one who created it to be used for his glory. And then I was asking the question, well, if God is is all about sex in that sense, confined to marriage, of course, but if if he's the creator of sex and it's a good thing, how come we don't talk about that in church? And in the midst of that conversation, we had some really amazing phone calls one of which came from a a young man named Dominic Denisi. And uh, I didn't know Dominic personally, but really loved the conversation that day, loved what he had to say about that issue. And I connected with him off air and in so doing said, hey, you need to come and be a part of our Spotlight Conversations on a Worship Wednesday where we put the focus on what Jesus is doing in and through his church. And ladies and gentlemen, here he is, all the way from the Rochester area (laughs) to Buffalo, New York, Welcome to Spotlight here on a Wednesday edition of NBL. Dominic, how are you? I'm doing well, Neil. Thank you so much. I've been looking forward to coming in studio. Well, it was an interesting phone call, and apparently there's a little backstory to that whole thing, because you had actually hung up the day we were talking, but decided to call back. Yes. I'm glad you did. Yes. Uh, I, I had to use the restroom very, very badly. I think it was about a 15, 17-minute wait, and uh, I just couldn't wait anymore. So I hung up, and I was really like, nah, I'm not going to call back. What's the point? And I'm so glad I did, because as soon as I called back, um, they put me through, and uh, the connection was made. Yeah. So. Well, I really appreciated the thoughtful stuff you had to say, and maybe we'll just touch on some sure. of that a little bit. But um, you're a big believer in family. You've got yeah. six kids, so obviously that plays into your understanding of what sex is about and so yes. forth but um yeah it was uh, interesting why did you let me just ask why you chose to call in on that particular topic i'm passionate about it i mean i obviously i have evidence that i love my wife and i took god literally when he said be fruitful and multiply uh-huh. <laughs> and th- these days when you have six kids i had five in six years by the way really yes and so when you do that people look at you like you have five or six heads uh-huh and the reality is that, as we know, you know, children, as it says in the scriptures, they're a gift mm-hmm. from the Lord. So that's the way I view it. And so when I was listening to the program about that topic, which is often kind of uh, evaded by the church at large because right. it's so sensitive, I thought, well, let me call in and maybe I can provide some insight. So I did. Yeah. Now, um, yesterday we were talking about Sheila Ray Gregoire's book called The Great Sex Rescue, and basically highlights the idea that you've been told lies about some things related to sex and even in the conversation that you and i had the day we discussed it several months ago there was um there was an individual called in and said basically in his estimation sex is merely for procreation Mm. and we know that to be true it's definitely for procreation but the question was is it also for recreation can sex be enjoyed by a husband and wife in marriage and I'm just going to put you on the spot sure. and say, what's your yeah, I have opinion no problem on that? with that? It's one of the ult- ultimate acts of worship, and that's what I said that day uh, when I called in. Right. I mean, it's, uh, yes, of course, we know. Be fruitful, multiply in Genesis. I already alluded to that. But God uh, created man in his image, gave him the, the helpmate. You know, Eve caused him to uh, deep sleep to fall upon, took the rib out, and, you know, the two became one mm-hmm. in every single way. And marriage, as I've discovered now, being married for going on 19 years with our six children, sex is one of the the critical aspects of your marriage that sometimes gets lost in the busyness and the progression of life. So Mm -hmm. if it was just for procreation, um, I'd probably be a bit frustrated, (laughs) to be honest (laughs) with you, as a a male and as a married man. Mm -hmm. Uh, But thankfully, I'm not. I still am very passionate about my wife in every single way. That includes physically, mm-hmm. and uh, I try to be open with her about uh, the area of intimacy so she understands what my needs are, and I have to be sensitive to her as well. Obviously, we're wired differently, right? right? I mean, I was thinking about uh, this illustration a while back. They say that men are microwaves and women are like ovens, you know, right, and I think right. that's true when it comes to intimacy, but certainly uh, pleasure. Sometimes, Neil, to be very transparent with you, um, I'll just like be thanking God. Uh, 
before, you know, my wife and I may engage in intimacy. I'll just not verbally out loud, you know, right. I don't, but uh, my wife and I, we've actually prayed before engaging in int- intimacy, those type of things. It is a beautiful, guiltless act of worship when done within the uh, sanctity of uh, the undefiled marriage bed. A couple of things, as long as we're talking about it, I get the impression that you think it's an area to be paid attention to. to Absolutely. To, to be nurtured and developed in a marriage, right? No no question about it. I, I'm, I'm um, officiating a marriage of a very, very dear friend coming up. And whenever we do counseling, marital counseling, uh, when my wife and I meet with the couple, we talk about the big four. And one of those big, big four areas is mm-hmm. intimacy. Mm-hmm. And it has to be addressed because inevitably, and you know as a married man for quite some time, you're going to have issues. There's going to be peaks and valleys in that area. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's an area that I have seen personally as a minister um, that people have allowed to suffer. And you could just be drifting apart. And meanwhile, um, Satan has an opportunity to have a foothold, on, uh, right. particularly on the male. Right. So then you alluded to this earlier. And, of course, it was the reason we had the conversation in the first place a couple months ago. Why is it so ignored in the church? It's so it's such a sensitive topic, and the reality is that you know that uh, the enemy in the world they've they've tried to steal it. Mm-hmm. What wasn't uh, meant, we know in the scripture it says in Genesis, right, that what was meant for evil, God God used for good. And if the church started to talk a little bit more about it, I think it would uh, help equip people and understand it. Obviously, from a biblical standpoint, but everybody, you know, think of the Song of Solomon. It's all about that. Yeah. Um, there's a proverb I say to my wife. She actually doesn't like it. I'm not going to share it with you on here, but it has to do with, uh, you know, her satisfying me. She always does. She satisfies me. I mean, my wife, um, like I said, I'm still physically attracted to her. Um, it's not an area that the church <laughs> should avoid. They should engage in it. But again, it's such a fragile, sensitive topic. It's pro- nearly impossible, probably not, to offend at least some. And that's probably why it's avoided. Okay. Just as a side note, someday we're going to do a show on verses in the Bible that you never, you never hear featured at Vacation Bible School. That's okay? a great, that'd be a great show. That would be a really interesting because yeah. it's the Word of God. It's living. It's active. It's sharper yeah. than any two-edged sword. Right. And it's right. it's valuable to us as believers uh, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Interesting. Correct. Let's focus on that for a second because it isn't just that God's Word corrects us; it actually teaches us how to live. Yeah. And so there's verses. Uh, I'll give an example. Proverbs thirty-one. We love that passage because it's about the proverbs 31 woman but if you actually look at it it, that gets into the proverbs 31 woman somewhere after verse Mm 6 because verse 6 in the niv reads this way give beer to those who are perishing (laughs) (laughs) now okay no no i got you okay yeah i mean it's talking about anesthesia really and i think comfort you know like if somebody's in hospice care you you provide comfort measures and maybe some medication to ease the pain and that's really what that's about but that's one of those verses that that we just avoid yes then some kid goes off to college opens his bible and and sees that verse in there and says hey i never saw this one in church what is this about why are we avoid why are we embarrassed now okay so you mentioned something in proverbs yesterday Mm -hmm. uh what our good news verse was proverbs 5 18 and 19 is because we had Sheila Ray Gregoire on to kind of continue the conversation we began a few months mm-hmm. ago. And uh, and that passage says, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife Amen. of your youth. One of my favorites. A lovely deer, a graceful mm-hmm. doe, let her breast fill you at all times with delight, be intoxicated always in her love. Which is a passage I raised on the day, the day that you called, yes. and the gentleman called saying, no, no, I think sex is really only for procreation. I said, well, what do you do with a verse like this? But Dominic... Oddly enough, we say we love the Word of God, that every mm-hmm. every word of it is inspired by God, and then we ignore a verse like that. Right. You know, that's kind of, you hit on the verse that I wasn't going to share, that I tell my wife um, that she, you know, satisfies me with. But I, I think it's, again, just there's, there's a multitude of reasons why we avoid that. But, mm-hmm. you know, coincidentally, inside my wife's wedding band, I have Proverbs 31.10. It just says, more than rubies. And the reality is that, uh, you know, it is so, so important that we address the full counsel of God. Mm -hmm. And when you don't address the full counsel of God, ignorance is a tool of Satan. Mm -hmm. And so if that young college man goes off and he's ignorant of what the Bible says about alcohol, then what's going to happen? He's going to fall. Right. 
And so I think the full counsel is important. You can't avoid things like the passage in Proverbs or Song of Solomon. And when you approach it, you should be approaching it in a biblical worldview and in a proper context where you say, look, Mm -hmm. this is what the Lord has waiting for you. I have this phrase, patience pays, because patience is a fruit of the Spirit. And I found every time I wait when I'm supposed to, I'm rewarded, and every time I'm impatient, then I suffer the consequences of Mm -hmm. that impatience. But I think if you approach these passages with your children, with other people, in the proper context, and you say, this is what the Lord intended this to be, and this is how it should look, then it's going to be beneficial down the road. And I don't want to belabor this, but don't you think that there's a fear? For instance, if if you were to sit down with a 12-year-old and mm-hmm. read them Proverbs 31, 6 in the NIV, right. and it says, give beer to those who are perishing, that's, mm-hmm. oh, somehow if you raise that question, they're going to run out, they're going to start drinking, they're going to become alcoholics. Yeah. Or you see this verse, well, then they're obviously going to fall into premarital sex, and they're mm-hmm. going to have children out of wedlock. and All of that is fear-based. We're talking about the Word of God. And to have a, 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 a mom and dad who love Jesus, who mm-hmm. are grounded in God's word, and not perfect by any means, sure. but willing to sit down and share these truths from God's word, why should we be afraid of that? The enemy has absolutely robbed us of, of the benefit that comes from that kind of focus on God's truth. Fear. Again, yeah. another, yeah. you know, the fear of man brings a snare. Right, mm-hmm. uh, the scriptures tell us as well, and uh, fear and faith are polar opposites, and so uh, we have to overcome that fear. You know that ties in even to sharing the gospel. Uh, why do so few people share the gospel? Mm-hmm. If you talk to most and being involved in that area of ministry specifically for many years, uh, fear, yeah. fear, fear keeps us from from uh, moving in faith, and right. I think that that's probably the answer to that. That's so well said. And I'm glad you're here. I so really, am I. I'm loving this. I'm, I'm enjoying beautiful it. studio. <laughs> we got to take a break, and um, we'll be back in a moment. I should mention that Dominic is you're a, a teacher at North Star Academy in Rochester. This year, yep. You have a business we'll talk about in sure. just a little bit that has sure. been sort of a tent-making business it for you. Been. What that means is that it's been a source of income Correct. while you pursue ministry in an Amen. organization, uh, uh, literally a, a ministry called Rescue and Revive yes. Ministries. And so we're going to talk about all of that when NBL returns, but we'll be back. Today's the day where we put the spotlight on what Christ is doing in and through his church, and we'll continue with Dominic Denisi from the Rochester area. He's our guest here on NBL. Today's program brought to you by Tyndale University and Seminary, and if you're looking for a quality undergraduate education or a seminary degree, Think Tyndale and visit their website, tyndale.ca. All right, back at it here on a Worship Wednesday edition of NBL. It's our spotlight conversation where we put the spotlight on what Christ is doing in and through his church. Dominic Denisi from the Rochester area, where do you actually live? I live in Greece. Greece, okay. Yeah, for the last 17 years, yep. Uh, He's joining us here to talk about God's work in his life and in his ministry, and the reason we do that is because we want you to be encouraged to know that God loves you, he's got a plan and purpose for your life, and whatever it is you're going through, God wants to meet you in that place. Uh, Dominic is somebody that called our radio show a couple of months ago, and we we kind of clicked on the air, and I yes. said, you know, if I get a chance, I want to have you in for a conversation. It was at that point you told me that you have your own radio show, yeah, yep, which that's... I didn't know. So tell us about that. Yeah, that's one of the branches of Rescue and Revive Ministries. You know, R- Rescue and Revive Ministries started in August 2018, mm-hmm. and uh, we actually had, I think, five branches at the time, and I kept praying, oh, we need one more, there's one more, and, and patience again, patience paid. I waited, and I was having a conversation with another Christian brother in a Dunkin' Donuts, and a, a gentleman <laughs> overheard me and said, are you guys Christians? I said, yeah, and gave me his card. Again, I was patient. I waited. I said, if this is the Lord, I'm not going to pursue this. He calls me one day. We get together. He connects me with the producers of, uh, or the owner of WISL mm-hmm. uh, in Avon. Next thing you know, we're signing a contract. We have the Rescue and Revive Gospel Show. Really? Yeah. We, yep. So what are the five branches? Well, now it's six or seven, oh, okay. <laughs> really. It's and growing? It, yeah, yeah. So uh, rescueandrevive.org is a website, but we have uh, the local. We have two local outreaches at the Open Door Mission. <laughs> every third Friday, and then um, Monroe Ave Street Outreach every second Saturday at 8 p.m. And then we have the radio program, Mm -hmm. of course. And then we have our Crusades, which started even before the ministry. I started uh, the Rescue and Revive Crusades throughout the Northeast and beyond to college campuses and the marketplaces back in 2016. So we're about to embark on our sixth one coming up in September. Um, We just started our um, international uh, branch. So Mm -hmm. we just got back from Kenya, just had a Kenya night. Uh, 
A lot of great work for the Lord. Kenya. Kenya. It's a long way from Rochester. It's a very long way. <laughs> and uh, it's an amazing story that would take a long time to tell, but uh, we just posted the 10 minute professionally made video mm-hmm. that kind of tells a story on our website. And um, rescue we al- and revive. Rescue, org. rescue and revive.org. And then okay. we also do an equipping course that we taught not too long ago um, Proclamation and Conversation Evangelism course. Mm-hmm. So. We actually did it in a one-day format. We had a gentleman flying from California for it, which blew me away. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had people come in from Albany four hours away, a couple from Clifton Springs, which is now connected with the ministry. So those are kind of the, the branches to the trunk, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's a hard thing, I would think, to describe. Somebody stops yeah. you and says, mm-hmm. hey, what do you do? You yeah, know, I, I'm a pastor, sure. I'm a missionary, I'm sure. a radio host. Yep. No, this is what I say to people. I say it's a mobile gospel ministry, or it's kind of like a church on wheels. Mm-hmm. That's what I tell people in the short, because that's really what it is. So, all right, I want to ask how you got called to that, but first, how did you meet Jesus? Because that's that's yeah. where it all began. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, uh, May 1st, 1988, I, I was a Catholic. If I'm my, my first name is Domenico, which I go by Dominic or Dom to make it uh-huh. easy on people. And um, in fact, coming in, this gentleman says, he heard me say, my name was Dominic. He goes, ah, that's my name. I said, no, it's not. It's Domenico. He goes, you're right. It actually is. <laughs> but um, basically, the reason I say that is I'm Italian. My father's from Italy, moved over here when he was 27 years old. My mother, Italian descent. Mm-hmm. If you're Italian, you inherit Catholicism. And I was Catholic all the way up until uh, May 1st, 1988, when I wept like a little baby in the back of Resurrection Bible Church, where I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. From that point forward, you know, I did the prodigal son thing around 16, started mm-hmm. with a girl. It lasted for about a decade. I was in the pig pen, and then just like the prodigal son, I came to myself. I realized that, number one, my f- Heavenly Father never left me. Mm-hmm. Number two, uh, he was waiting for me with open arms. Mm-hmm. And um, I always knew that that was the truth, that I couldn't, you know, I could not, ultimately uh, veer from that. Mm-hmm. So when I came back and went back to Resurrection Bible Church, sitting in the parking lot by myself, scared to go in, these people that knew me as a boy, I went back in, no condemnation, really? open arms. Praise and God. from that point forward, I met my wife a week later, and that was uh, over 20 years ago. Wow. Never they, looked back. Did they kill the fatted calf? <laughs> <laughs> felt that way to me in my spirit. So in yeah. 1988, what was a good little Catholic guy like you doing in the back of Resurrection Church? <sighs> well, no, I went with my mother. My mother converted, and uh, my mother actually just passed away when I was in Kenya, oh actually. My. I'm sorry to It's hear okay. That. She had Alzheimer's for a long time, 20 years. But um, she converted from Catholicism um, through our um, my, uh, my aunt, mm-hmm. my great aunt now. Uh, my late great aunt, who was from Italy as well. We mm-hmm. used to go there in the summer, and they used to go to Assembly of God, and that's where the seeds were planted, and eventually my mother converted, and that uh, led me to convert probably a year or so after. What was it about what she heard that didn't square with what she had previously believed? You know, that's a great question, Neil. Um, I can't tell you the, the one exact uh, thing. I, I know that she had good friends that were strong Catholics. I think after a while, you just have to you come to a realization that and this is what I ask people. I say, when I share my faith often with people, I'll say, do you really think Jesus Christ was brutally crushed? Do you think his back was shredded open, a crown of thorns put on his head, so you could be religious to just go through the motions, or so you can enter into a covenant relationship with him? Mm-hmm. And I think that was probably illuminated to my mother. So you came to Christ in 88, ran from God for a while, as just, most young people yeah. do, mm-hmm. came to your senses. Mm-hmm. How old were you when that happened? 25, 26. Okay, met yeah. your wife shortly there. Right after. after. And she was yeah. a believer? She was in the exact same spot I was. Really? Exact same spot. In fact, we were on our first date. Um, you know, I was, we were getting ready to go out to eat, and uh, I said, I'm just going to tell her who I am. And uh, I was telling her, I'm like, I'm a born again Christian. She was blown away. She's like, I can't believe this. I go, what, you are too? She's like, yes. And we were just in the exact same spot, just mm-hmm. coming back. <laughs> Think, and think maybe God had a plan in mind? I, I believe so. Okay. <laughs> I believe so. So everything just came together, and, um, you know, all glory to God. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ecclesiastes 9.9. 9. I remember sitting outside of the mall praying about, you know, if, if this is really the woman for me, right? Mm-hmm. And Ecclesiastes 9.9, 9, your wife is your portion in this life. And that was the, the confirmation of God's word to say, yes, this is the one. And I felt like the Lord said, 
if you marry this woman, you will be blessed the rest of your days, and that's been true. She is an amazing Proverbs 31 woman, in spite of my shortcomings, failures, and everything else. And now we're going to have her join us live on the air to highlight what some of those are. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, I was going to say, my <laughs> wife, she runs from any type of spotlight. You say spotlight, the name of the show, she'll run. Oh, that's when the she show gets really good, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's amazing. So how precious that God brought the two of you together. And by the way, you quoted um, the Bible verse or a mm-hmm. portion of the Bible verse um, that's from what? Proverbs 31. That's uh, yes. Proverbs 31 more than 10. rubies. You yes. Said? Yep. On the inside of the marriage of the wedding band. Yes. Yep. I'm, I'm wondering how many guys are listening that had that maybe at the time put a Bible verse inside their wife's wedding ring that could mm-hmm. still quote it today. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Say something. Inside mine, she put Lord help me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a plea for yeah. help. No, it says um, uh, blessed. I, in fact, I'd have to read it, but blessed to be yours today and forever. Something like that. I don't wow. know. Yeah. Amazing. So you've been married about 19 years. Six kids. Six kids. Yeah, six children. Yep. And all five right off the bat. Like Five and six years. That's what I tell people. I love my wife. You know, the questions I'll get is, is it all one woman? Yes. Um, you know, are you Mormon? Are you Catholic? Those type of questions. But the reality is, is that, uh, you know, I just felt like it was in God's hands mm-hmm. um, until the last one we found out almost six years later. Then I waved a white flag. A little bit of a surprise yeah, there. I, I waved the white flag. I said, Lord, I really... Because, and you know, a pastor friend of mine said something that was very, very wise and profound one time. Mm-hmm. Five children, great man of God, um, has really raised his children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And he's like, you know what? I'd love to have a, a hundred children, but I, I look at it as a sacrifice for the ministry. He's a full-time pastor. Every child that you have... Um, puts more weight on the bar, so to speak, to use weightlifting terminology. Mm-hmm. And I'm just at the with being in the ministry, having a small business, all this. You know, I'm going to be if the Lord grants me two more months, I'll be 46 years old. I just am at my maximum. Mm-hmm. I just can't put any more weight on the bar, you know, or else I'll drop a plate. So don't want to drop a plate. No. Well, we've got way more to talk about here. Dominic Denisi, our guest, and he is host of a radio show called Rescue and Revive that airs. Yep. Sundays yep. on WYSL, 1040 AM, 92.1 FM, 95.5 FM in the Avon, Rochester area. And I want to encourage you to check it out. But you can also see his website, rescueandrevive.org, for more information on his life and his ministry. But I want to dig into that part, sure. find out not just why God called you into relationship with him, but what he called you to do. And that's really at the crux of our conversation from this point forward. So we'll be back in just a moment with... Dominic Denisi on NBL, and I invite you to stick around. There's a lot more to come. Today's program is brought to you by the personal injury lawyer, Joseph Sayuna. Let's get back to it, and thank you for listening, those of you who are tuned in across western New York State or uh, southwestern, uh, I should say southern Ontario, from the, you know, Fort Erie area all the way east, Toronto, beyond Oshawa, all of it. Thanks for tuning in. Dominic Denisi is our guest here on NBL, and he's a guy who wears a lot of different hats. And mm-hmm. I, you mentioned about not wanting more weight than you can bear on the bar of life, meaning right. as a dad and a husband and so forth. Mm-hmm. But you also are part of a ministry that is multifaceted. Yes. So, I mean, now including trips to Kenya, mm-hmm. you got a radio show, you're doing street outreach. Mm-hmm. How do you keep all that straight? Yeah, well, number one, right? Paul the Apostle said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Mm -hmm. So all glory to God for everything. And you have to be mindful of when to say no. Mm -hmm. And I've had to learn that the hard way. Um, I'd like to believe that I've grown as a father and as a husband. Um, I believe my wife would, would attest to that. And so I've learned over the years what to say yes to and what to say no mm-hmm. to. That's and not easy. No, it isn't. But and you know sometimes you know my wife will sometimes say, well, you know if you're not if you're not leading it or whatever the case, you don't go to. It. The, the reality is I don't have a lot of bandwidth left in what I'm I'm uh, l- trying to build here right. for the glory of God, and that doesn't include you know my my children's ball games and their events. You know, all the other things that you kind of have to go to. Mm -hmm. So I believe balance is a key principle in the scriptures. Balance, 
I'm trying to keep, and that's where I use that illustration of the weightlifter, because when you put too much weight on, all of a sudden mm-hmm. the, the bar wobbles and the <laughs> weight comes off, and you have to know when you're maxed out. What is your max? For me, I'm pretty much maxed out. I mean, I have all the responsibilities I can handle, and in fact, there's other things I do I'm trying not to do. You know, when I need to fill gaps, I'll Uber drive, or I'll do things like that, and I'm trying to take those things and let go of those. I really want to mm-hmm. focus on, you know, the work of the ministry and, uh, you know, my small tent making business. And so therefore I can also manage my family, which can be challenging. Uh, you know, as you know, with all the responsibilities in a large family, mm-hmm. you have to always be mindful and prayerful of those things. You know, the name Chuck Swindoll. Yes. Okay. He's obviously credible Bible teacher. And he's mm-hmm. been on our radio station for decades. Yes. Um, at, He's been in ministry now well over 50 years, but Mm -hmm. I actually interviewed him right around the time of his 25th anniversary of ministry, Mm. and I said, Chuck, you've been on the air for years. You've been in ministry 25 years. What's the most important thing God ever taught you? You know what he said? What's that? Balance. Amen. (laughs) Well, praise God. If Chuck said that, I feel good about that answer. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if you've ever been in a gym when you know when a a plate did fall off one side of the bar especially if you're bench pressing Mm -hmm. all of a sudden the bar starts rotating Mm -hmm. back and forth as plates drop off each side it's really not a comfortable very embarrassing (laughs) yes (laughs) um been there done that but so then i'm i'm picking up that that as a a minister of the gospel of jesus christ involved in rescue and revive ministries which you founded so right yep so that's a donor supported ministry it is so you're you're out i mean other than the fact that you have a small tent making business which we mm-hmm. can touch on but you're you're walking by faith amen yeah i have been for a long time and you know back in 2004 i started in the ministry teaching seven and eight year olds and mm-hmm. uh, at that time it was my home fellowship quinnonia mm-hmm. fellowship i had no idea what was going to happen the next 16 my, my desire was just to be a phys ed teacher coach varsity basketball and then god changed everything and and so it's been it's been a faith walk, and I've been reflecting back on it. And when I first started sharing the gospel, I used to just go out on the streets, sometimes with a group of men, sometimes by myself, holding up a Bible, uh, carrying a cross, multiple things. Mm-hmm. And then God just giving the increase as you continue to walk by faith. Because one thing I've learned is this. If it's not built by faith, then it's not of God. Mm-hmm. So you have to walk by faith, not by sight. And I think maybe that's where people uh, maybe err a little bit. Right. You know, they just uh, say they don't have enough faith. You coach girls basketball? Yeah. At North Star? I did this past year, yes. Okay. So you got a passion for basketball? Yeah, I coached. Again, I started coaching in 1999. Uh, seventh grade girls basketball, Greece Apollo. I absolutely fell in love with it. And at that time, I wasn't, I was still in the pig pen, so to speak. I was yeah. a prodigal at that time. But it was such a, so impactful to me that I made the decision at that point I wanted to be a varsity coach at the mm-hmm. minimum. Well, it took 22 years to get to that this past year, and it was effortless because it was God. Wow. So. Yeah, well, <clears throat> we've done so many programs with teachers and coaches over the years. Apart from parents, teachers and coaches have a tremendous amount of influence, and, and they're right there at the very mm-hmm. top of, uh, of influence makers in the lives of kids. Mm-hmm. So you've been in a position of being able to influence young women in particular, I guess, through mm-hmm. ladies' basketball. Mm-hmm. Praise God that you're using that for God's glory now. Um, did you play ball growing up? Yeah, I played through high school. Um, maybe I could have sat a bench for a junior college team. <laughs> maybe. I mean, I like to say I was decent, you know, but yeah. yes, I played from the time I was in fifth grade all the way through high school. I bet you could thump level. the rock, bro. That's what I'm thinking. Not anymore. The <laughs> only thing I could thump right now is probably, you know, my calf muscle or something like that. Because <laughs> when I was on staff and leading Awana, we would play uh, pickup after with the kids mm-hmm. and the parents. And I even then pulled my calf muscle a couple times, and that's when I officially like, you know what? I'm st- I'm just going to play golf. That's it, and walk, <laughs> and I take brisk walks. Yeah. You know, lift a little weights, push up stuff like that. But as far as basketball, that is not a game that's designed for the designed for the middle aged to older man, in my opinion. I know yeah. there's those that do it. God bless them, but not with six kids and all the other responsibilities. So yeah, all right. So you backed off a little bit. Um, but talk about the business itself, because that is a source of income for you, yes. and it's something you've been doing faithfully. In fact. I found out that one of your clients used Mm -hmm. to be right here in the building where DCX is located. U.S. Security Associates, I might go see them. Um, Ready to Respond Training Services, which is uh, the website's readytorespond.net. Started in 2005, Mm -hmm. the way everything else has in my life, by the grace of God, by faith. I was actually a phys ed teacher Mm full-time, coaching basketball in a public school at the time. 
And uh, I went. I needed another filler. I needed something else for income, so I went to Securitas, and I said, they said, hey, why don't you become our CPR instructor, and then we'll give you on-call security. I said, okay, I'm a teacher. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. Went, became an instructor. Little did I know that, uh, you know, a handful of years later, that would be um, what I would do primarily to allow me to – a support my family and B do the work of the of the ministry mm-hmm. and it's been kind of the um, that's been my tent making ministry just like the Apostle Paul to allow the spokes to move around the hub of the wheel and the hub of the wheel being the gospel of Jesus Christ and my family. Amen. Yeah, yeah the Apostle Paul was in what was called tent making ministry. Right. And so some other source of income that helps to fund what God has called you to as a as a servant in His kingdom. Mm-hmm. And it's just amazing that you've been willing to cooperate with that because yeah. that's not easy. You got a lot of irons in the fire. It comes at a cost, and I was talking to Ann about that out there. It comes with a cost. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, I'm not I'm not going to sit here and tell you all the things that I've had to endure or go through. But part of the cost is um, lesser income. Mm-hmm. Part of the cost is lesser benefits, uh, lesser retirement. You know, all those type of things. But you have to stay vertically minded. You got to stay focused. Matthew six thirty three: Seek ye first the kingdom of God, mm-hmm. and all His righteousness, and everything else shall be added unto you. And that's why Jesus, you know, He said, "Count the cost." A lot of people don't do that when they when He called His disciples. He said, "Do you, you know, does anybody that's going to build a tower doesn't sit down first and see if they have enough materials to build it, mm-hmm. lest they stop and then the people mock them?" And then He makes a similar illustration with a king going to war. And I did that. I did that for the work of the ministry, but. It does come at the cost, to some extent, of your family, of your marriage, of your income, and that's just a reality of the gospel. Jesus says, anyone that comes after me uh, you know, must hate his mother, br- uh, brother, father, wife, and his own life, or else he's not worthy of me. And he means that literally. There's no way to, to, to gloss over that and to say, well, he doesn't really mean what he's saying. No, he means it. He, he requires uh, supreme devotion. You know, and I tell people, the reason I serve Jesus Christ is very simple— First John four nineteen. Mm-hmm. I love him because he first loved me. Right now, you, when somebody says that he didn't really mean that, describe what you mean in saying it. The reason I'm, I'm saying that is because a new believer, a non-believer, might say, well, "Wait a minute, Jesus said that we're to love others as mm-hmm. we've been loved, and that um, yeah. you know, greater love is no man than this that a man lay down his life for his disciples uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and for his friends." So, um, okay, help us understand what that actually means. Yeah. Uh, that that's that's a great question. You know, I one time taught a sermon on this when I was on staff at a church on a Wednesday. I remember it very well because um, I called it "Go for the Gold." And what we do a lot in modern Christ- Christendom mm-hmm. is we put we try to put that second greatest commandments and flip it with the first. And this is what I tell people: when Jesus was asked what's the greatest commandment, he said, "Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength." The second is like the first: mm-hmm. love your neighbor as yourself. You cannot try to you cannot love your neighbor as yourself unless you love Christ supremely. Mm-hmm. And so, when you love Christ supremely, that means He's going to come first in everything. Second is a far, far second. Right. Well, that's so well said. I was tracking with what you were saying there because that's the truth, and that's the part that most people don't really want to focus on. Amen. Uh, it, Plus, when it comes to counting the cost, I know we got to take a break here, but when it comes to counting the cost, some people count the cost and say it's too costly. Like you're right, that pursuing God is more than really what I'm able to do, and so I'll just I'm going to go to church yep. on Sundays, try to be a decent human being. But I, I believe Spot we're on. being robbed at that point. You're, I agree, I can't agree with you more. And it's not a matter. You know, the Lord showed me a long time ago. You're not you're not to condemn people for this. You are you count it as Paul said a privilege. He says I count everything else as dung. Mm-hmm. That I had to get the opportunity to, to press toward that mark, you know what I mean? Right. Everything else he accomplished meant nothing to him because he gets to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's huge. Dominic Denisi is our guest. He is a, a bunch of different things. He's involved in the security business, but is truly a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not on staff at a church, but he has been in the past. Uh, he runs a ministry that literally has a focus on meeting people on the street, teaching encouraging equipping he's a missionary he's a lot of different things including a basketball coach at north star academy but we've got a lot of conversation left here and only a few minutes to get to it so we'll take a break we'll be back in just a moment nbl brought to you by faith um i'm sorry firth i just said faith uh firth jewelers 2435 military road in niagara falls new york longtime advertising partner they've been with us over 45 years if you're looking for quality jewelry at affordable prices Get to Firth. 
All right, back at it here. Final segment with Dominic Denisi, our guest today, as we put the spotlight on what Jesus has been doing in and through his church. 1988, Dominic came to faith in Christ. Then, as many young people do, kind of ran from God for a while till he came to his senses. And then when God got a hold of his life, uh, he revealed to him how much uh, he was desiring that Dominic would yield his life to him and serve him in ministry. And that's exactly what he's been doing. Um, your ministry, Rescue and Revive, I'm sure it takes you a lot of different places. Do you ever do pulpit supply? Do you yes. speak in churches? Yes, and I love it. Yeah, really? I, yeah, I do. Yep. Now, I, I sense that you've got a pastor's heart, but you're not in mm-hmm. pastoral ministry, although mm-hmm. you were for a time. So mm-hmm. explain that. Yeah, it's you know we were talking about that. Uh, you yourself can relate to that. You mm-hmm. know, being a pastor on staff for eight years. What I realize is this: you know, pastor means shepherd. Mm-hmm. And I saw this one uh, other evangelist. Uh, his brochure said an evangelist with a shepherd's heart. And, you know, that would kind of fit fit the bill for me, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I love people. I love God's church. But I have to be moving. I have to. The Lord's called me to start works, to lay foundational things, to build, to equip others. And my call is more to the kingdom than the tribe. And when I say that, uh, tribes are fine. Most people are part of a tribe. They're a Baptist. They're a Nazarene. They're Pentecostal. But what I tell people about Rescue and Revive Ministries is that it's always kingdom over tribe. And so for me, I love all those people, those denominations I just talked about, and mm-hmm. I appreciate all their differences. But I need to be about the kingdom of God and not just about one specific tribe. Has that always been your heart, or did you arrive at that place? I think about 12 or 13 years ago, uh, God kind of gave me the revelation of that. And I realized being on staff at the church, you know, when I was on staff at the church— uh, according to fellowship, I learned so much. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I really, I thought being an evangelist, being a pastor, very similar. It's really not. Um, you know, there's similarities, but it, it's very, very different in the sense that you need to be married to that church if you're pastoring it, and I need to be married to the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. And so uh, along the way, God revealed to me, I could tell you this, never one day do I have any unrest about Rescue and Revive Ministries. I know how it started. I know I'm smack smack dab in the center of God's will by his grace. So so it's about building the kingdom, but what, what's the short version? Like if you're on an elevator and somebody says, tell me about Rescue and Revive Ministries. Yeah. You've got the radio show and you're doing mission outreach and yep. you're on the streets, but how do you how do you describe it? Uh, again, I'll just say that it's a, it's a gospel-oriented ministry. It's a church on wheels. It's a parachurch ministry. It depends on who it is. I try to be sensitive to who I'm talking to. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I can't explain it all in two minutes, but I, I focus on the gospel. Right. And just explain to them, hey, it has multiple branches to it, but it all centers on the Lord Jesus Christ. Do do your wife and kids participate with you in ministry? To the extent that they can. Mm-hmm. Uh, my wife, we just had a Kenya night. My wife and kids were all there. They uh, they helped clean up. You know, everybody that was there for the most part knew them. Uh, my daughter, Selah, my 13-year-old, she has led worship. She's got a worship leader's heart. She's She's got a very good voice by God's grace. Uh, my sons have been out on Monroe Half with me, street ministry, which they find very, very intriguing. I mean, it's they learn more there, I could tell you this. They learn more on the streets there than any church service can ever do. And that's no discredit to the church. I love the Church right. of Jesus Christ. But they have seen more spiritually mm-hmm. and learned more than any church service could ever give them. How come? Why is it? They have seen spiritual warfare. They've seen manifestations of demons. They've seen people yelling, screaming. They've seen their father and other people, how they're to react to that. Mm-hmm. They, have, uh, they have just witnessed, and they've witnessed uh, lots of good as well. They've seen people in tears after being prayed for. They've given food. I mean, they've just, it's, uh, my wife came out. My wife came out one week, because Mono Wives, a, it's a mm-hmm. it's hot spot spiritually right. at that time. She came out one night, and I was so blessed because she got a taste of what's out there. And that particular night, we had a man literally crying out on his hands and knees, what I believe demons were being released from him. And we had another uh, gentleman at the end of the night who was being ministered to in tears, and then it was like a a switch just flipped. And he had conveniently mentioned that, you know what, he had a gun on him and that he could always pull it out. And that's when I motioned my wife to get out Mm -hmm. of there. And, you know, God obviously protected us, but it is a a, uh, seminary in one night, Mm -hmm. basically. So. Eyes are open to what spiritual warfare yeah. is about and yep. the power of God mm-hmm. to overcome. So um, let me throw something out there and get you to respond. Because I, I do believe 
I mean, for somebody like you, to a large degree, you're living on the edge. You're living by faith, and you're putting yourself in a place where God can use you. That's kind of atypical. This is, you know, not what we normally think about when we think of Christianity. We think of, you know, parachurch ministries or churches being mm-hmm. the be-all, end-all. You're kind of mm-hmm. everything rolled into one. But, but, but where I'm going with this, I've had people say to me over the years, you know, I, I just don't see God at work in my life. I, mm-hmm. I, I don't really see him doing amazing things. And, and I have a theory on this. First of all, let me mention, Henry Blackaby wrote the book Experiencing God, and mm-hmm. there's an entire curriculum that goes with it. But his basic premise is that God is always at work around us, and he invites us to join him in his work. So instead of waking up in the morning saying, well, what can I do to accomplish something for God's kingdom? To ask the question, Lord, I know that you're at work around me. I may not exactly see it, but would you bring it to my attention so I can obey you and pursue you in whatever it is you're doing in my life, in my family, in my community? And I will get personally involved in what you show me to do. Okay. So when I was on staff at a local church here, we did outreach every Wednesday night. And we were, at one point, we had 20 teams of three people going out into the community. 60 people just going to visit shut ins and people who had visited the church previously or, you know, just knocking on doors and bringing Mm -hmm. cinnamon bread and whatever, just kind of trying to love on people and get to know them. And what I learned there is if you knock on somebody's door and you ask them how they're doing, you're going to hear stuff you didn't expect. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, you have a choice to make. Lord, what are you showing me about this thing? Classic example, and I've used it several times, so if you're a regular listener, you've heard it before, but I remember standing in front of someone at a a door and they said, oh, we're doing quite, quite well, but we got some bad news. Well, what was that? We're going to have to move, and by the end of the month, we got to be out of this place. That's this coming weekend. Problem is, you know, my 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 husband's sick. Uh, mm-hmm. My kids are living in other states and stuff. I, we have no one to help us move this weekend. Mm. Silence. So you got a choice to make in that moment. Yeah. God, are you saying that we need to get involved in this? Is there a way that we can minister to this family? My point being that if we say that we're going to make ourselves available to God, He'll show us, and then we right. have a decision to make: Are we going to join Him or not? But I think, you know, and when we did, when we said yes to the things God was showing us to do, now there was things we thought we ought to be doing, but when you say yes to the things God's showing you to do, you'll see lives transformed, including your own. You'll be stretched to a place where God's beginning to reveal himself to you in ways you hadn't seen before, and that's when Christianity gets really exciting. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I always tell people, (laughs) you know, the moving thing. You find out who your true friends are when you need to move, right? Exactly. No, no one really wants to do that type of work, but yeah. uh, the reality is, is yes. If you make yourself available, right? It's like uh, the prophet said, Isaiah, mm-hmm. here I am, Lord, send me. Mm-hmm. If you really take that approach, uh, the Lord will honor that. And his thoughts and his ways are different, mm-hmm. right? As high as the heavens are from the earth, his thoughts are different than ours. And it'll probably be not be what you expected, Never. Right. The the Lord, you know, a man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his steps. I found most everything I'm doing is not what I thought I would be doing when I was, you know, 12, 13, 15 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, But God is good. And uh, I continue, one thing I'll say is this, might be a little off track. I continue to underestimate the goodness of God. Mm -hmm. He continues to just blow me away with how good he is. And then the other thing is, and I'll tell people, don't under, never underestimate the goodness of God, or, unfortunately, in their natural state, the depravity of man. Mm-hmm. And so I think you just have to be available. Make your, If you're really going to make yourself available to God, he will do great and mighty things in your life if you're just willing to say, Lord, here I am, send me, use me. Amen. And I hope that you believe it today, listening to that statement, because I, I fully believe it. And God is able to do far above anything we could ask or imagine if we're willing to simply say yes to his plan of purpose for our life. And it's part of the reason your story, your testimony is so exciting, because across the board, you've said, God, whatever your plan of purpose is, I'm yours. That doesn't make you perfect. I'm sure you struggle in certain areas. Absolutely. Um, your wife's going to be on next week to define <laughs> all of that. But <laughs> I'd love to. I'm trying to have her come on my show, and that's that's hard Real, to... Yeah, she does not... She loves... She's a service-oriented mm-hmm. person. She'd be that person. They said, move next week. She'd be like, yes, please. Where can, look, where can I go? What can yeah. I do? She loves service. She has a gift of hospitality. She loves cooking for people. She, I mean, she really does. I mean, people say, come sit down. I'm like, no, I'll just let her do it. She loves it. Mm-hmm. She does not like the spotlight. She's behind the scenes, and so it works out very, very well. Once in a great while, uh, you know, <laughs> 
You'll see her out at events. She she loves people, but she just yeah. she likes. I admire that in her. Yeah. I mean, because that's yeah. a true servant. She has no desire um, for glory, no desire to be in the spotlight. And uh, so when I enter the gates, I'll be way in the back, and I have a feeling she'll be way in the front. Well, the greatest among you, yes, must be the servant of all. Mm-hmm. What's her name? Leslie. Leslie. Yeah, Leslie. And your kids? Say their names because your dad's on the radio right now. Okay. Um, Bria is almost 17. She mm-hmm. just graduated from North Star Academy. I dropped her off at a full-time job this morning before I came in. Wow. Lorenzo's 15. He's out scraping paint with uh, good friends and other fellow ministers today. Okay. Sayla's 13. She's my worship slash missionary um, hearted one. Gentle Judea. He's 11. He'll be 12 July 5th. He is, uh, he's kind of like a deacon. Mm-hmm. Um, he's just service-oriented, sweet, gentle kid. Gabriel is my kind of righteous John the Baptist type one, very sincere. He's mm-hmm. 10. And then the one that came late is Evangelina. Uh, she'll be 5 July 20th, but she brought, I call, one of my nicknames of her is Love Love, because I tell, I say, why does daddy call you Love Love? It says, because I give double portions of love. So she's, oh. <laughs> she's, she's definitely brought that to us. I mean, she brought a lot of love to us because we knew, you know, yeah. providing a miracle doesn't occur, which I pray it doesn't. She's our last one, uh, biologically speaking at least. So, yeah, I love them very, very dearly. They mean a lot to me. Awesome. So glad that you took the time to share a little bit about each one. That's Thanks. just amazing. Um, and Gabriel likes locusts and wild honey, I think. Is- yeah, I could see him. If there's one that would eat locusts and wild honey, it would be him. <laughs> yeah. And loincloth. Camel's cloth. Yes. Okay. No more about that. <laughs> anyway, um, let's pray just for God's blessing in your ministry. And by the way, Zach Mann and I are going to be on your radio yes. show sometime soon. That's yes. really cool. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. Lord, I, I thank you for Dominic and the ministry you've done in his life and how you're using him and his wife and his family uh, to build your kingdom. I thank you for the many facets of the ministry you've called him to. I pray for your continued provision in his life, Lord. Uh, being involved in tent-making style ministry means that Lord, he's doing what he can to earn income in one area, but at the same time completely relying on you for uh, income in order to be able to support his family and the needs of the ministry. But you're the God who owns everything. God, you're in charge, and I just pray that you would pour out your abundance in his life and that uh, evidence would be seen in his ministry as they continue to expand and go to places like Kenya and, mm-hmm. and have radio shows on various stations. And God, thank you for all of that. But most importantly, we thank you that you're lifting up your name in the midst of everything and that Uh, Dominic is cooperating in the process of lifting up your name. And God, I just pray that they would continue to be kingdom-focused, knowing that tribes are important, but kingdom is really what matters most of all, that you came to build your kingdom, God, and and that uh, you desire for us to be involved in that work. So I thank you for the friendship uh, that I share with Dominic here. Pray for your continued blessing upon it. And Lord, we look forward to hearing continued reports of what you're doing in transforming lives for your glory. Let it be all about you. So thank you, God, for letting us put the spotlight on what you're doing in and through your church today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you All so right, much. so rescueandrevive.org, if you want to learn more about Dominic Denisi, rescueandrevive.org, and of course, you're available for pulpit supply. Yes. Love doing mm-hmm. that. So anything else you want to know, check out rescueandrevive.org. We'll be back with more of NBL. Thanks for being with us. Dion, we'll be thank back you so much. Right after this from our friends at Cornerstone Bookshop in North York, Ontario. And yes, following the lockdown in southern Ontario, Cornerstone is open.